The following program contains material and language considered adult in nature. You may wish to use discretion when watching with younger viewers. On this visit to the film lounge, a ghoul is stymied by a creative challenge. A man seeks his family in a shifting universe. A transplanted filmmaker meditates on the power of love. Quad Cities youth learn the art of filmmaking. A young crime victim tries to foil her killer. And a librarian is swept off his feet by a mystery girl. Hang on tight. It's the Film Lounge. Funding for the Film Lounge has been provided by Produce Iowa, State Office of Media Production, building a statewide network of support for the film community in Iowa. More information on how you can connect is available at produceiowa.com. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Bravo Greater Des Moines, investing in arts, culture, and heritage nonprofit organizations throughout central Iowa. And Iowa Arts Council, empowering Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by cultivating creativity, learning, and participation in the arts. Learn more at iowaculture.gov. It's two venues that I see that I can see myself working as a storyteller. Um, one as a comic book artist or writer, comic book maker. The other is um, filmmaking. I started about two years ago, and I haven't really had any actual, uh, I haven't gone to school or anything, just been learning a lot of YouTube tutorials and watching movies. That's about it. Uh, Lazy One's more or less an embodiment of um, procrastination. Um, there is something that the phrase lazy bones, lazy bones is something my English teacher would say. She would say lazy bones, lazy bones. And that meant that, you know, should not be procrastinating. Major part of it was that the working process of an artist. Um, sometimes you're not satisfied with what you create, even though you keep coming at it and you keep getting distracted, but then you come back at it again and in the end, you're never really satisfied with what you have.
No comas mucho porque vas a engordar. Through actually began, uh, the idea came about from a dream that I had, and the dream was uh, I saw myself being isolated from my family, and I woke up almost in a panic because I realized that would be one of my greatest fears, and um, from there I started um, playing with some of the ideas of isolation and how one would react to being um, separated from their family. We wanted to use certain film styles to enhance the feeling of the lack of control of the character that you were watching, where we filmed the entire short film handheld. We didn't use any stabilizers or shoulder rigs. We wanted to have it be that shaky feel, almost uncomfortable, where you, you realize that he is not in the driver's seat whatsoever. He is simply um, battling against this force that is for some reason keeping him from his family. Um, and so we shot it handheld and then we shot with a completely open aperture where I would constantly be coming in and out of the frame of focus um, so you never fully feel like he or you are in control.
Where am I? Hudson. Mom? Mom? And you change places. And this change, you have no control over. Yeah. Wherever you're trying to go, when you get there, will you be happy? Yes. I just need to get back to my family. Where are they? I don't know. I, I found my home. I heard their voices and then it, it happened again. I... Tell me about them. I'm the oldest of three, two younger brothers, my parents. Do you miss them? More than anything. Do you think that they miss you? Yes. I just need this all to stop. I will you help me? No. What do you mean? I no. I can't. I can't do this no. anymore. I have to be back with my family. No. You don't. You don't understand. You have to help me. Goodbye, Jack. No. No. You have to help me.
promised. Promise me you'll come back. What do you mean? Promise. Mom. 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 Mom! Mom! Do you think that they miss you? Help me! Dad? Honey? Are you done? Transplanted is a hybrid film, an experimental film that uh, follows the story of, or the genesis of a transplant, or what I would call, or considered an alien species or form, uh, maneuvering through spaces in the landscape of the United States and basically trying to find what they would consider a place for home. In Transplanted, I use a lot of texts. Um, spoken word text from a scholar known as Bell Hooks, and she is very, very well known in, in the field of sociology. One thing that drew me a lot to her text was the idea of love and the idea of how groups of people have either been made to believe they are incapable of love or the idea that love is something that is maintained or given to certain groups. I think just reading her struggles of trying to understand love, her love with her father, her love with family, it made me realize that the understanding we think we have of love is more than just the idea. It's, it's so much more. And I feel, um, at least for me, through making films or making artworks, is my exploration of trying to understand this thing that we call love. Love takes off the mass that we fear we can't live without and know we can't live within. I use the word love here, Baldwin writes, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace. Not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. Had 
racism so dehumanized black folks that we were incapable of love. In the diaspora, most black people's relationship to love has been shaped by the trauma of abandonment. Whether we take as the foundation of our psychohistory, the African explorers who came to the so-called New World before Columbus, the free individuals who came in small numbers as immigrants, or the large population of black people who were enslaved and brought here against their will, this is an emotional backdrop full of the drama of union and reunion of loss and abandonment. Since our leaders and scholars agree that one measure of the crisis black people are experiencing is lovelessness, it should be evident that we need a body of literature, both sociological and psychological of work, addressing the issue of love among black people, its relevance to political struggle, its meaning in our private lives. Every black person knows individuals in the communities of their upbringing who were abandoned by biological mothers and fathers and raised by caring kin. Often caring kin do not give to their adopted children necessary emotional care, even though they provide shelter and meet material needs. Sustained loving care is needed to help heal the pain of emotional abandonment. Throughout our history in this nation, black people have tried to deny this pain to act as though it does not affect our capacity to trust. Without trust, there can be no genuine intimacy and love. Yet for those among us who have been abandoned, it is difficult, if not downright impossible, to trust. To move toward love, we must confront the pain of abandonment and loss. This means speaking what may have once been unspeakable. When I was a child, it was clear to me that life was not worth living if we didn't know love. I wish I could testify that I came to this awareness because of the love I felt in my life. But it was love's absence that let me know how much love mattered. I was my father's first daughter. At the moment of my birth, I was looked upon with loving kindness, cherished, and made to feel wanted on this earth and in my home. To this day, I can't remember when the feeling of being loved left me. I just know that one day I was no longer precious. Those who had initially loved me well turned away. The absence of their recognition and regard pierced my heart and left me with a feeling of brokenheartedness so profound I was spellbound. Grief and sadness overwhelmed me. I didn't know what I had done wrong and nothing I tried made it right. Love is profoundly political. Our deepest revolution 
will come when we understand this truth. Only love can give us the strength to go forward in the midst of heartache and misery. Only love can give us the power to reconcile, to redeem, the power to renew weary spirits and save lost souls. The transformative power of love is the foundation of all meaningful social change. Without love, our lives are without meaning. Love is the heart of the matter. When all else has fallen away, love sustains. So that's why our culture of domination does not wish us to know love. Because if we have love, we have that power to stand and to rise above all of the circumstances that are crushing to the spirit and to still see our beauty, to still dance in a circle of love that we create for ourselves. We all long for loving community. It enhances life. But many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. Knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with others. No other connection heal the hurt of that first abandonment, that first banishment from love's paradise. For years I lived my life suspended, trapped by the past, unable to move into the future. Like every wounded child, I just wanted to turn back time and be in that paradise again, in that moment of remembered rapture where I felt loved, where I felt a sense of belonging. When I leave this moment, I'm going to leave this behind. When I go up to my room, I'm going to restore my soul. I'm going to bring forth the beauty, the grace, what I need. I am not going to be there in bondage to whatever happened to me. We have to begin to reclaim our own agency. The more I reclaim my own agency through the recognition of my power to love, both myself and others, the less I am afraid in any setting because the more I believe that I can draw to me that which is good in my life. When you think about filmmaking, yes, it is very much an art form. It is a way of expression, it is a way of creativity, it's a vessel for truth. 
I want them to be able to tell their own stories and not have stories told for them. I want them to uh, use that creative energy to go out into the world and just say like, hey, this is my voice, this is what I want to say. My name is Jonathan Burnett and I'm the creator and lead instructor of Urban Exposure Film Program and I'm also a filmmaker. So Urban Exposure is a 10 week intensive program that I run during the summers. Um, we go through the basics of filmmaking which is uh, directing, writing, cinematography and editing. We have an age range of 17 up to 21 and I want to try to have all kids from different communities and um, ethnicities and cultures to be involved uh, so we can just create, you know, that, uh, that diversity in the QC. Azimbuki African American Council for the Arts is made up from a lot of different um, community members that were doing work in the arts and mentoring and different things with young people. And we have our premier program, which is Urban Exposure um, Summer Film Program. I looked at the students that I had worked with over the years and what I see is that they don't understand that that could actually be a vehicle for them to have employment. They don't see the arts as an industry that can fund their lives and so they need to understand that their creativity, their passion, their talents can be utilized someplace else. What amazes me the most is just the growth and how it happens in a short amount of time. Like, 10 weeks is really not that long to learn all these skills, but they just take to it. And it's just amazing some of the images and the dialogue and also the acting that comes out of these films. It just, uh, it, it blows my mind every single time. My name is Clovis Kanis and I made the film Melancholy. And it's about a young boy named JD, and we basically get to see a uh, sort of beginning to end how he dealt with his depression. From there, things just seemed to spiral. It was a very emotional experience overall, and making the film was emotional itself, but it, it all worked out in the end because finally, finally people got to see what I was trying to say. Everybody has a bad day. I learned a lot that I can't really do things by myself as much as I like to. I know now that I gotta have someone behind the camera, I gotta have someone beside me when I'm in front of the camera, different things like that. My name is Miranda Castaneda and my film is Feathers. It is about a young artist. She doesn't see the beauty in herself or in her art, but she meets somebody in the cemetery that helps her to realize that and the greater things that she's capable of. This isn't worth my time or yours, so just go away, please. No, I'm not gonna leave until you can tell me your name and answer my question. Why draw something nobody will ever see? The most rewarding part was working together with everybody. I remember after shoots having, I mean, our actors are dancing everywhere and having a fun time. Everybody becomes a family. I'm Cooper Harrison. I served as director of photography on Melancholy and Feathers. I don't think many people understand how much goes into it. I think when you go to the theater and you see a movie, that's about it, but you don't really think about the director, the way that the camera works, and how the camera moves, or the actors, and how much goes into that, and the sound. And then after that, we have a red carpet event for the participants and they get to invite friends and family and we have the screenings at the Figgy Art Museum. And so the kids really felt like, you know, this was their red carpet moment. It was standing room only, people were sitting out on the stairs and, you know, they're crunched in. I told my parents that I was making a film and they expected to come here and see some like little play or whatever. They didn't really understand. I was, I was really nervous. I didn't know if people were gonna like it or not. And luckily people did, and so I helped uh, calm my nerves. 
we tell stories to teach lessons. And the best way to learn a lesson is to live it. And I think filmmaking is the closest thing to actually living something. This was a chance for me to uh, just get out of my comfort zone and it really helped because now I'm ready to do things I've never done before. The following film contains material and language considered adult in nature. You may wish to use discretion when watching with younger viewers. What I am doing is learning more and more about filmmaking in order to make more films. So Lily's my first film I've ever done. Lily is about a young girl who is watching over her killer and knowing that he's always going to come back to kill someone else, she will not release him. So she stays until whenever he stops. After watching Lily, I really hope that the viewers will take this to heart. Um, what happened on this short film has actually happened something similar to one of our crew members and by that she was able, able to overcome the circumstances and Lily actually helped her with that. So what I really hope the viewers will take that into heart and actually really protect themselves when certain circumstances break out in this way.
A fellow filmmaker and friend of mine here in uh, Des Moines, uh, Michael Wilson, uh, came to me and he said, hey, I've, I've got these friends, they're the Maytags, I'm, I knew who the Maytags were, and, and they were asking me, hey, we, we've been making some music videos, but we'd like to take our music videos in a different direction. So Michael, knowing that I'm a narrative filmmaker, he said, I know, you're, I know the guy, I've got the guy for the job. We all developed the concept together for the most part. I wrote the scenario and came up with the specifics of the idea of the storyline. We knew that we had sort of limited funds and, and limited time with everybody involved and, and, uh, and we wanted it to be sort of in one location just to make it easier on us all. I kind of started from the end and I knew I wanted the climactic moment uh, of the story to break into you know, our characters to break into dance and to include everybody and I wanted, you know, I wanted that to be the climax. So I started from there and I, you know, I was sitting at my computer one evening when I kind of had that idea and I was like, well, where am I going to find 
swing dancers, you know? So I just got online, I looked up, and there was, you know, to my surprise, at that moment, there was a dance, um, like a, a weekly dance club meeting right then. It was like eight o'clock at night. It went until nine, so I like ran out of my house, got in the car, drove to uh, this this uh, small dance hall, and I introduced myself uh, around a little bit, and it just so happened that I introduced myself to the two people who ended up being the stars of the music video. My, my, you're so fine, girl. Why you gotta be so cool, girl? Always acting cool, girl. My, my. you are my Gonna make you 
Funding for the Film Lounge has been provided by Produce Iowa, State Office of Media Production, building a statewide network of support for the film community in Iowa. More information on how you can connect is available at produceiowa.com. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Bravo Greater Des Moines, investing in arts, culture, and heritage nonprofit organizations throughout central Iowa. And Iowa Arts Council, empowering Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by cultivating creativity, learning, and participation in the arts. Learn more at iowaculture.gov.